بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبروا آياته وليتذكروا الألباب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم صاد كتاب أنزل إليك فلا يكن في صدرك حرج منه لتنذر به وذكرى للمؤمنين اتبعوا ما أنزل إليكم من ربكم ولا تتبعوا من دونه أولياء قليلا ما تذكرون وكم من قرية أهلكناها فجاءها بأسنا بياتا أو هم قائلون فما كان دعواهم إذ جاءهم بأسنا إلا أن قالوا إن كنا ظالمين فلنسألن الذين أرسل إليهم ولنسألن المرسلين فلنقصن عليهم بعلم وما كنا غائبين والوزن يومئذ الحق فمن ثقلت موازينه فأولئك هم المفلحون ومن خفت موازينه فأولئك الذين خسروا أنفسهم بما كانوا بآياتنا يظلمون ولقد مكناكم في الأرض وجعلنا لكم فيها معايش قليلا ما تشكرون ولقد خلقناكم ثم صورناكم ثم قلنا للملائكة اسجدوا لآدم فسجدوا إلا إبليس لم يكن من الساجدين قال ما منعك ألا تسجد إذ أمرتك قال أنا خير منه خلقتني من نار وخلقته من طين قال فاهبط منها فما يكون لك أن تتكبر فيها فاخرج إنك من الصاغرين قال أنظرني إلى يوم يبعثون قال إنك من المنظرين قال فبما أغويتني لأقعدن لهم صراطك المستقيم ثم لآتينهم من بين أيديهم ومن خلفهم وعن أيمانهم وعن شمائلهم ولا تجد أكثرهم شاكرين قال اخرج منها مذكوما مدحورا 
لمن تبعك منهم لأملأن جهنم منكم أجمعين ويا آدم اسكن أنت وزوجك الجنة ويا آدم اسكن أنت وزوجك الجنة فكلا من حيث شئتما ولا تقربا هذه الشجرة ولا تقربا هذه الشجرة فتكونا من الظالمين فوسوس لهما الشيطان ليبدي لهما ما غوري عنهما من سوآتهما وقال ما نهاكما ربكما عن هذه الشجرة إلا إلا أن تكونا ملكين أو تكونا من الخالدين وقاسمهما إني لكما لمن الناصحين فدلاهما بغرور فلما ذاق الشجرة بدت لهما سوآتهما وطفقا يخصفان عليهما من ورق الجنة وناداهما ربهما وناداهما ربهما ألم أنهكما عن تلكما الشجرة وأقل لكما وناداهما ربهما ألم أنهكما عن تلكما الشجرة وأقل لكما إن الشيطان لكما عدو مبين قالا ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا قالا ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته <coughs> Exalted be the name of our Lord, the Majestic, the Most High We put our trust in Him and upon Him we rely he sent us a prophet whose message no sincere person can deny. And he revealed to us a sharia that we strive to exemplify. We ask him to forgive our sins on the last day and our good deeds amplify. Today, insha'Allah ta'ala, we will move on to Surah Al-A'raf. And it is a perfect follow-up from Surah Al-An'am. And Surah Al-An'am and Surah Al-A'raf, the both of these surahs, they are revealed in a very similar time frame. In fact, some of our commentators say that they came essentially back to back. And uh, therefore, this is a mid to mid to late Makki surah. And Surah Al-A'raf, it revolves around the perpetual fight between truth and between falsehood, between good and between evil. Amongst the children of Adam, and even before that, amongst Adam himself and Shaytan Iblis on the other side. So this entire chapter is about the perpetual battle. It's a, non, it's a non-stop battle, ongoing battle between the people who believe in Allah, the people who want to live ethical and moral lives, and versus those who do not. And the entire surah, therefore, is trying to prove this point via history of the past, via reminders of the Day of Judgment, via even conversations between the people of heaven and hell, as we, will, as we shall discuss, insha'Allah ta'ala. Therefore, in this surah, there are also many reminders of Allah's blessings. There are many warnings of the possible uh, punishments as well. And this surah, Surah Al-A'raf, it is in fact one of the longest, in fact, technically it is the longest of the Meccan surahs. There is no Meccan surah longer than this. Of course, Baqarah is Medan, you remember. So a relatively long surah, this surah. It has 206 verses and it is more than a juz and a quarter. More than a juz and a quarter. And in fact, it is also 
correct to point out that this was the uh, first of the longest surahs to be revealed. So Baqarah and Ali Imran and Nisa and Ma'adah, these are the long surahs. The first eight or nine surahs are considered to be the Tiwal or the long surahs. And Surah Al-A'raf, which we're going to do today, is the first chronologically in terms of revelation of all of these uh, surahs. And the surah begins, as you heard our Qadi Sahib recite, uh, with strong exhortations to believe in the Qur'an. And the stage is set that this is going to be an entire surah, or much of the surah is going to be about stories. And by the way, many other uh, surahs in the Qur'an are focused on stories. Uh, for example, Surah Yusuf, when we're going to come to it, is the entire story. Uh, surah Qasas as well is majority stories. Uh, this surah as well, more than half of it is about different uh, stories. And in verse number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rhetorically asks, how many nations before you have come and gone? You're not the first, you're not going to be the last. So Allah azza wa is reminding us that humble ourselves. We think that we're gonna live forever. We never really think about history that, you know, a time will come when we will be something of the past. Allah is speaking to the Quraysh and the Quraysh thought they would live forever. Now the Quraysh are something of the past and a day will come when me and you will also be something of the past. So Allah azza wa is setting that stage that learn from the peoples before you. And in verse number seven, uh, that فَلَنَقُصَّنَّ عَلَيْكَ بِعِلْمٍ We're going to tell you stories. فَلَنَقُصَّنَّ We're going to tell you قصص. We're going to tell you stories, and these stories are stories of knowledge, stories of truth. وَمَا كُنَّا غَائِبِينَ Allah is not narrating a story that he doesn't know, that he heard from a third party. وَمَا كُنَّا غَائِبِينَ I wasn't absent. We were not absent. We were there. We saw everything. Allah is telling us the eyewitness account, not just the eyewitness, but the one who is the one who is the Rabb of everything. He is going to narrate to us the stories so that we can benefit from them. And of course, this uh, surah has many, many stories. The first of them, our Qadis al recited some of it, is the story of Adam and Iblis from verse 11 to 25. And please read this section. It's one of the most detailed in the entire Quran about this particular incident between Adam and Iblis. So many lessons to learn uh, from this section. Of them is that Allah honored us. We are the blessed creation of Allah. Even the angels, the Kiram and Katibin and Jibreel and Mikael and Israfil, even the angels, these noble entities, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked them to bow down to us, to show us honor. Have you ever felt that level of thankfulness that that deserves? That Allah chose you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored you. So let, let us live up to that status that Allah chose for us. We also see over here the dangers of arrogance, of rejecting the truth because of pride, which was the sin of Iblis. That Iblis knew the truth. And Iblis knew right from wrong, and yet his pride got the better of him. We need to be very careful. Our Prophet ﷺ said that pride is one of the unforgivable sins. To feel yourself that you're going to reject the truth simply because it comes from a source that you do not like. And we have to be very careful and monitor in our daily lives about this uh, this uh, evil of feeling a sense of pride against other people. We also see over here another evil, and that is the evil of racism. Iblis was the first racist. Iblis was the first racist. Iblis said, I am better than Adam. Why? Not because of my iman, not because of my taqwa, not because of... No, because you created me from something. You created him from something else. He looked at something that has nothing to do with actual betterment, actual nobility. He looked at something that is secondary, and that is his origin, or his, his asl, or where is he originally from, what is his skin color, whatever that type of racism might be. And he said, because of this, I am better. And so Iblis proves to be the first first racist, anyone, anytime someone feels himself better than another person because of something that is not in his control, because of where he's from, because of the passport, because of his socioeconomic status, because of anything that is not related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that person is following the path of Iblis. And by the way, even if we have piety, a sign of piety is to not describe piety to ourselves. So even if we have more piety than somebody else in the eyes of Allah, we will not think we have more piety than somebody else. That's one of the ironies of piety. So Iblis is the first racist because he thought himself better. Ana khayrun min. I am better than Adam. Of the wisdoms of this story and the morals of the story of Adam and Iblis as well, is that no matter how uh, wrong Iblis was, Iblis in the end turned to Allah for what he needed. And Iblis 
made dua to Allah. Qala anzirni ila yawm yub'athun. Iblis is making dua to Allah and saying, Oh Allah, let me live until the trumpet is blown, until the day of judgment. So at times of desperation, even Iblis turned to Allah. How foolish therefore is the one who denies God and never turns to God. That person is more foolish and more misguided than even Iblis because even Iblis was forced to worship Allah for one point that he needed. Of the wisdoms we learn that Iblis got his dua answered. Iblis, his dua was responded to as our scholars of the past commented, O Muslim, how can you despair of your dua being answered when Allah even answered the dua of Iblis? Never give up hope. Allah answers all duas of all the makhluqat when they turn to Him sincerely. So this is a wisdom we learn over here. It also shows us as well, by the way, uh, the foolishness of, of, of jealousy because Iblis was granted a long life. Iblis is going to live longer than any human being amongst us, right? Iblis is going to live. He was there from the time of Adam, right? And he shall be there until the trumpet is blown. No human is living that long. Now, can you imagine that long life? What is his goal? What is the agenda that Iblis has? His entire millennia, hundreds of millennia, what does he want to do? He wants to simply misguide other human beings. That's it. I mean, subhanAllah, what did he gain by this? You know, even a thief when he steals your money or something, at least he gets something in his pocket. Iblis, shaitan, and all of his minions that support him, what do they gain by seeing us misguided? Nothing. They only gain satisfaction that they have misguided another entity. SubhanAllah, are we gonna be that foolish that we will listen to an enemy that is that the only agenda the enemy has is sheer jealousy that Allah chose Adam over me, so I'm gonna be an enemy to Adam. Adam and the children of Adam. We also see over here in verse number 16 uh, that Iblis he blamed Allah قَالَ بِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي that, that uh, he said because you have deceived me O Allah you deceive me then I will waylay them on the straight path and I'm going to attack them from every single side from behind them from in front of them from the right from their left and you will find that the majority of them will be thankless subhanallah they will be thankless we have to ask ourselves, are we thanking Allah for His blessings? If we're not, Iblis has won. The majority of them will not acknowledge the blessings that you have given them. And it also shows us as well that Iblis and his minions are a perpetual enemy to us. That this is an enemy that we have to be vigilant against. And that enemy in the Quran itself, Surah Al-A'raf itself, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ That Iblis and his tribes, they can see you from a dimension you cannot see them from. They have access to our world, we do not have access to their world. They can see us and they can interact with us by waswasa, by whispering. And we cannot see them, it's something that is alien to our eyesight, we cannot see them. Them. So they have that advantage over us, but we have the advantage of Iman, we have the advantage of the Quran, we have the advantage of Allah being our side. SubhanAllah, Iblis does not have any uh, help from Allah. We have Allah's help, and therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In the shaytani kana da'ifa, that the plotting of Iblis is always gonna be weak. The plotting of shaytan will always be weak. That shaytan will never win you when you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this also shows us as well, by the way that when we blame Allah for our sins, we are literally satanic. When we say it's all, it's all divine fate, it's all qadr, it's not my fault. Whenever we blame a sin of ours, whenever we blame a mistake of ours on Allah, this is satanic. Because Iblis said it's your fault, O oh Allah, even though Iblis did not bow down. And the Adamic methodology, the methodology of our father Adam, the Adamic methodology is to own up to one's own mistakes and to say, verse number 23, They said, our mother and father, these are our parents, our mother and father, they said that, O oh our Lord, we have wronged ourselves, even though Iblis wronged and Adam wronged. But Iblis ascribed the wrong to Allah and Adam ascribed the wrong to himself. And that's why Adam was forgiven and Iblis became Iblis. So always humble oneself, always acknowledge the mistakes and ask Allah's forgiveness to blame Allah, to blame Qadr for one's sins 
to exonerate uh, your sins because of qadr. And of course, unfortunately, it's very common. You meet people that, why aren't you praying? Oh, it's Allah's qadr. When He wills, I'm going to pray. No, everything is qadr, but you don't use that excuse when you uh, go to work and you earn money. You don't use that excuse when you go and earn your rizq and you go grocery shopping and say, oh, you don't expect things are going to fall down from the heavens. You go and you work, and then you realize everything is also qadr. The same goes for religiosity. You stand up and do wudu, and you face the qibla, and you perform the salah, and you realize everything is with qadr. So this also shows us as well, the story of Adam and Iblis, that no human is perfect. No human being is perfect. Our father Adam, Allah created him with his own hands. Our father Adam, he lived in Jannah. Let that point sink in. He lived in Jannah. Can you imagine the first few days, months, years on this earth? Can you imagine how, I mean, the shock for our father and mother. Can you imagine they would not even know how to eat and drink and how to, this is their punishment that they happened because of one morsel that they ate, one morsel of food that they disobeyed Allah. But there are our father and mother and Allah Azza wa Jal forgave them for that. And so this shows us that look, perfection will not be found in Adam or in the children of Adam. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, all all of the descendants of Adam, they are sinners, all of them. And the best of the sinners are those who repent. This also shows us that disobeying Allah will bring about repercussions in this world, if not the next. Disobeying Allah, we have to suffer the consequences for that. And it shows us that no matter the gravity of the sin, no matter how grave the sin that is, is that it is that we have committed, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always forgiving. You know, the sin of Adam wasn't just one morsel if you think about it. He was chosen by Allah. He had seen what no other human has seen. He has interacted with the angels. He lived in Jannah. Look at all of that maqam that he was given. And yet he still did what he did and he was still forgiven. Subhanallah. This is in a nutshell, the Adamic story really is the story of humanity. All the morals, and I have actually given a much longer lecture, which now is not the time, but I have given a, a 10 part series. It's not online yet, but I have given a long series about the Adamic story and the benefit it's from the Adamic story, all of what we need to, to survive on this earth, we find it in the Adamic story. All of the morals and the lessons is beautiful amounts of information. So read that section of the uh, surah. Verses 26 to 33, the next section of Surah Al-A'raf, the tone changes. And it goes into detail regarding a very important aspect of morality, modesty covering one's aura. We are explicitly told that of the goals of shaitan, verse 27, of the tactics of shaitan is to cause us to act immodestly and to cause us to be stripped and to be naked. This is one of the tactics of shaitan. We are explicitly told that, Ya Bani Adam, O children of Adam, we have sent down clothes to you. Notice we have sent down, it's coming from us. It is a divine gift. The animals don't have it. It is a gift. Allah has given to you. And our scholars, some of them mentioned that Adam and Hawa, they came down with clothes. Some of them say this is an ikhtilaf. They came down with clothes. That when we sent your mother and father down, they were wearing clothes. They were not like the animals. And uh, the other interpretation is that we have gifted you the knowledge of clothes. We are the ones who told you to wear clothes. Why? So that you can hide your aura, your body, and you can beautify yourselves with. And then Allah says, but remember, the covering of taqwa is better than the covering of clothes. Make sure you cover your clothes, yes, but have taqwa as well. Now all of this, it really shows us that true civilization, true humanity is not in nakedness. It is not in debauchery. It is not in shedding our clothes to be animalistic. The Quran is very explicit. True civilization is in embracing that gift of Allah and in dignifying ourselves. Really, it is a, a dignity that Allah has given us that we wear modest clothes, not the licentious system that, that is now uh, prevalent. And we ask Allah for his afiyah and forgiveness. And the Quran, therefore, verse number 31, it instructs us. And by the way, this entire section, it's very rare in the Quran. Ya Bani Adam, Ya Bani Adam, Ya Bani Adam. It's very rare. In this section, that is the motif and the norm. 
Allah is saying, this isn't just for you, O Muslims. This is for all of mankind that I preferred you and I gifted you with many things. And of the things I gifted you is I gifted you with clothes. I gifted you with decency and modesty. That, and then Allah says to us in particular that take your best clothes when you go to the masjid. It's good to wear clothes when you, uh, fancy clothes when you go to people's houses, when you go to events, but surely the masjid of Allah, it also deserves, in fact, it deserves even more dignity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly tells us in verse number 32 that these beautiful uh, gifts that I've given you of good clothing and of good food, I meant it for the believers. Don't make it haram. In fact, Allah rhetorically asks, who is there that can make this haram? I have made it halal for my servants. It is meant for them. The beauty of this world of good clothes, obviously halal clothes, obviously both men and women, they have laws that they have to follow. If those laws are met, go ahead and wear good clothing. Embrace the dignity that Allah has given you and wear them to the masajid. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, good food as well. I didn't make it haram, it is all halal for you. Kulu, go ahead and eat that which is pure. Like our father Adam and our mother Hawa, Allah said to them, enter Jannah and eat as much as you want of this food, except for one tree. Similarly, Allah is telling us in this world, everything that is halal for you, enjoy it in a quantity that is good, using money that is pure, make sure the food is halal and pure, go ahead and enjoy it, it is all permissible for you. And of course, this verse shows us that our religion, tells us to embrace the good of this world and to look forward to the good of the next world as long as it is good in this world. Meaning, and we explained this before, halal money and halal uh, food that is being ingested as well. The next uh, section, uh, passage uh, 34 onwards, the stage is being uh, set that future prophets are going to come and these prophets will be warning about uh, the judgment of heaven and hell. And in this section as well, we have the only time in the whole Quran where a interesting category appears and it is this category that the surah is named after. I didn't mention what the surah means because I was waiting for this. A'raf means the people in the high places the people in the high places. That's what A'raf means. What high places? This section is the only section in the Quran that references this. And it talks about a, a position that is between heaven and hell. And there will be some people, A'raf, that they are not in Jannah, and they're not also in Jahannam. And they can see people in Jahannam and recognize people in Jahannam. And they can see people in Jannah and recognize people in Jannah. And they don't know whether they will enter Jannah or not. And the Quran is not explicit that they will enter, but our scholars read in that they shall enter Jannah eventually, but the Quran is not explicit. And the people of the A'raf, they are waiting. They're eager to enter, but they have not yet entered uh, Jannah. And Allah describes the conversation. Please read this conversation. There are three categories, the people of Jannah, the people of Jahannam, and the people of A'raf. Who are the people of A'raf? A lot of commentary has gone into this. In one sentence, uh, I will tell you, inshallah, the correct position, and that is that uh, the people of the A'raf are the sinful amongst the Muslim Ummah. Those who didn't do their job the way that they should have, yet they still did something. So we can say they failed the exam, but not with an F, maybe with a, some, maybe like a D grade or something like that. In other words, these are the struggling Muslims that they, they, they were people who committed major sins and never repented. They didn't pray properly. They, they were taking uh, riba without having any notion of its sin. So all of the major sins are well known and also all of the rituals are well known. Those that were lax in their rituals, uh, those that were lax about uh, doing the major sins, that type of combination that they still believe in Allah, but not to the level of the righteous, to the salihin. So these are the people of the A'raf. So there are three camps now. They're going to be the people of Jahannam, A'raf, and Jannah. Go ahead and read that section and then ask yourself a simple question. Which of these three do you want to be in? Because in the end of the day, all of us are going to be in one of those three camps. Now is the time to try our best to decide and to work to make sure we are in the first category and that is of the people of Jannah. After this begins now the bulk of the stories of the surah. And from verse 59 onwards, we have in quick succession 
five prophets and their stories summarized very beautifully subhanallah again and please brothers and sisters the goal of my class uh, and my lecture is that you then read the Quran and read the translation uh, this is just the introduction it's not meant to audhu billah take the place so uh, verse 59 is this surah, uh, the, the story of the Prophet Noah, Nuh. Verse 65 onwards, the Prophet Hud. Verse 73 onwards, the Prophet Salih. Verse 80 onwards, the Prophet Lut. And verse 85 onwards, the Prophet Shu'aib. These five Prophets, Nuh, Hud, Salih, Lut, and Shu'aib, all of them, they have one or two paragraphs beautifully summarized. And look at the common theme throughout all of these. The common theme, the constant struggle between good and between evil, between truth and between falsehood. Always the prophets are coming and they are commanding their people with pure, beautiful commands. Allah, worship Allah. Don't you want to attain piety? They're telling their people, look at the blessings Allah has given you. Look at the fact that He made you so strong in one, in one of the civilizations. In another civilization, look at the fact that He has blessed you to carve houses into mountains. And to this day, uh, in that portion of Northern Arabia, we can, we can see those structures that have been carved into the mountains. Their houses were in mountains. They were the first civilization to do that. And, and the Prophets are reminding them, look at all of these blessings that Allah has given you. Thank Allah. And then along with this, there is always the moral message as well. Whatever was the moral evil in one tribe, do not cheat the people. In another tribe or another prophet, do not corrupt the land. In yet another, the prophet Lut, do not approach men with lust instead of women. Why are you doing this indecency? Always in all of these, the message is the same. Be grateful to Allah, worship Allah, and live ethical lives. This is Islam, simple as that. Thank Allah for what He's given you, and that means you worship Allah the way that He deserves to be worshipped, and then you live good lives, ethical lives, pure lives, moral lives. And yet, what is the response? In every single one of these times, it is to ridicule the messenger before they ridicule the message, to make fun of the persona, because it's easier to attack the messenger. It's easier, easier to attack the person. In English, this is called the ad hominem attack. And so they say, you are uh, uh, dalal, you are misguided. They say, you are a fool, you are safaha, you're showing stupidity. They ridicule the teachings, not because of what the teachings are teaching, but they will say, do you want us to abandon our ways? Do you want us to abandon our forefathers? And this story is still being played out in front of our eyes as we speak. When a Muslim preaches Islam, what is the accusation? Oh, you are backwards. You are this, you are that. You want to change our civilization? We have the better civilization. Same story. And in each of those cases, who is the one attacking the prophets? قَالَ الْمَلَأُ قَالَ الَّذِينَ اسْتَكْبَرُوا The elite, the creme de la creme, the nobility, the rich and the powerful, they are the ones who are objecting to the message. And who is following? قَالَ الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا The meek, the humble, the weak, they are the ones following. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, the message of Islam, it is threatening to the people of power, first and foremost and they are blinded by their power, and they're greedy for their power. So they do not want the message of Islam, because the message of Islam destroys that power, because the weak get their power from the all-powerful. The weak become the powerful, because they have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they destroy the status quo, which is a status quo of tyranny and injustice, and therefore the tyrannical people, they are the ones who can never accept. And who follows? Who embraces the faith the first? It is always the weak and the meek and the humble. They see the truth and they see the beauty of it and they embrace it. And we see this in every single civilization across the globe. Do not be surprised, dear Muslims. In fact, this is the same scenario that is happening right now in front of our eyes. It's the same scene, it's just a different script, that's it. But the same concepts are here. And our Prophet wasallam is being told, this is how it always is, and this is how you as well are going to have to do, Ya Rasulullah. After all of these stories, there are a series of verses that are so relevant in light of what is happening with the, uh, with the current uh, COVID uh, virus and the coronavirus lockdown, that I think we should actually pause and go over them verse by verse. Because SubhanAllah, I would read these verses and other verses of this nature, and I would never ever think that maybe I can see the manifestation of those verses in our own lifetimes. I would always think, yes, that is something of the past. 
and to see how the entire world has come to a screeching halt, to see global economies collapse, to see the GDPs of countries start going down, to see multi-billion dollar corporations file for bankruptcy, to see the entire globe in terror, to see the masajid shut down. Wallahi, who could have ever imagined what we are seeing now? And this all happened instantaneously. It all happened in the matter of a few days. Who could have ever imagined this now? Read these verses. Allah says, verse number 96, he first praises righteousness, that had the people of these towns believed and turned righteous, we would, we would have opened for them all the blessings. The blessings of the heavens and earth would have fallen on them, but they rejected. So we seized them by what they were doing. Then Allah says, do the people who of these towns, of these villages, do the people feel secure that our power will not come to them at night when they are sleeping? Do they feel safe that they're going to be alive by the time the morning comes? Do the people of the towns, do they have that that delusion that they feel secure that our power and might will not come to them during the day when they are playing around? Do they have the authority to feel safe from the planning of Allah? None can feel safe from the plans of Allah except those who are lost. The mu'min is ever terrified. The mu'min knows the power of Allah. And then verse 100. And look at this verse in light of coronavirus. Those who inherited the land after these previous people we destroyed all of them. Those who inherited the land after these previous people, can they not see the truth? Can they not see that if we willed, we could strike them for their very sins? If we will, we could do the same thing to them. And subhanAllah, I used to read this verse and think these are things gone. And now we see this reality right here and now in front of our eyes. And this is not the time I have given khutbahs about this topic, about why we are being inflicted with this. But there is no question that this is a communal adab because of too much zulm and fitna and fasad that has happened around the globe until finally enough was enough. And now the reckoning in a certain way is coming. And still we need to repent to Allah and, and uh, make sure that we are not punished at the individual uh, level. After this section in the surah, longest story in the whole surah, from verse 104 to 171 on and off, the whole, more than almost half the surah, almost uh, more than a third of the surah, and it is dedicated to the story of Musa and Fir'aun and the Israelites. And there's so much wisdom over here. It is one of the longest uh, chapters with regards to the story of Musa in the whole Quran. And of course, the story of Musa itself is the longest story. It is the most frequent story always told in the Quran because the parallels with our nation to their nation and the parallels with the Prophet Muhammad and the Prophet Musa, they are the most. And in this, again, there's way too much to summarize here, but some of the points here in the uh, conversion of the sorcerers, when the sorcerers convert, and they go from being the worst of the worst until bec to becoming the best of the best. They fell down in prostration in front of the entire crowd and they were willing to be persecuted to death within an instant. It shows you that even the worst enemy can potentially become your ally. It shows you that Allah's help comes from strange and mysterious sources. Who could have ever predicted that the sorcerers who were meant to uh, uh, fight Musa yani in the battle of the, the, the magic, who were meant to win over Musa, the sorcerers would become within the army of Musa and against Fir'aun. And this is what happens when you have Allah on your side, that help comes to you from sources you could never expect. And in this section as well, we learn of something uh, new phenomenon that has not been mentioned in the surah up until now. And that is the phenomenon of irritations and nuisances and grumblings and complainings from within the camp of the believers. You see, the previous sections have talked about the enemies of the prophets, but there's something that also is within the ranks of the followers of the prophets, and that is those who are not really firmly upon Iman, those that are grumbling and complaining. And this now begins in Surah Al-A'raf, we find this multiple times as well, and this is the reality of our Ummah as well. Not everybody is Abu Bakr and Umar al-Siddiq, not everybody is to the level of the Sahaba. There are those who they are on the fence. There are those who are, they have some good and then they're also struggling and doing things that are harmful to them and to the Ummah. And we see this in the story of Musa and his followers of the children of Israel. 
when Musa comes to them and tries to cheer them up, verse 129, they rebuke Musa. The followers of Musa, they say, uh, They say, we were persecuted even before you came. What good have you done? You were supposed to save us, O Musa. Your coming was supposed to free us of Fir'aun. Before you came, we were punished. We're still being punished. What, what, what good have you done to us? SubhanAllah. Again, that, that notion of they just want perfection and ease instantaneously. And in fact, we hear as well in this story of Surah Al-A'raf, we hear as well of the incident of them after having been saved from Fir'aun, crossing over the Red Sea and then worshipping a false god. And it shows us that sometimes the believers themselves, they're going to fall short and they're going to do some major problems and sins. It also shows us as well, the, the Fir'aunic story, the story of Fir'aun, that Allah Azza wa punished the people of Fir'aun multiple times with minor punishments until the major punishment came. Uh, verse 133, uh, We sent upon them the flood, we sent upon them the locusts, we sent upon them the lice, we sent upon them frogs, we sent upon them blood. Uh, all of these were explicit signs. If you read the books of Tafsir, these were massive problems that afflicted Egyptian society and every single time the entire society it is like basically locusts everywhere until they cannot even live and they realize this is a punishment from Allah so they go to Musa and they say call your Lord to get rid of the locusts so Musa does it they, they say we'll believe when the locusts leave they do not believe then the next one come the next one come in all of this we see that Allah does not destroy a nation until they're given some opportunities Allah does not destroy a qawm until they have a few chances even Fir'aun despite his pharaonic evil even Fir'aun was given in this ayah five chances one after the other but Allah says they were too arrogant they were too sinful of a people Allah Azza wa Jal does not revel in punishment Allah does not love to inflict punishment but some people deserve it and even when they deserve it they're given opportunities and chances therefore O Muslims if one of us does have a minor issue or problem or minor adab in our lives that are coming let us wake up let us realize this is a wake-up call let us make sure and understand that Allah is giving us an opportunity to be better it is meant as a mercy for us not as a punishment if we turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Surah Al-Araf goes on, and in this section as well, we have the famous uh, incident of Musa asking to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قَالَ رَبِّ أَرِنِي أَنظُرْ إِلَيْكَ That Musa is asking to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is a blessing that even the prophets wanted. They wanted it, but they will not get it in this world. It is a blessing that will only be given to the people of Jannah and it will be given to all of us who enter Jannah. It is the ultimate goal of every believer. Dear Muslim, don't you want to see Allah? Don't you want your face to be shining bright? Wujuhun yawma idin nadira. On that day, faces will be shining bright. Why? Ila rabbiha nadira. They will be looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Musa wanted to see Allah, and Allah said, You cannot see me in this world. It's not possible. Your flesh and blood cannot do that. That's only something that can happen when we are in a different phase, in a different state, and that is of the uh, akhirah. And also in this section, uh, Musa is given al alwah, which is uh, the tablets, the holy tablets. The Musa is given the alwah, and our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us that Allah wrote the alwah with his own hand. Allah wrote it with his own hand, and he gave it to uh, Musa. And Musa spoke with Allah directly. He was one of the three people that we know of who spoke to Allah directly. Adam spoke to Allah directly. Our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam spoke to Allah directly, and Musa spoke to Allah directly. By directly, we mean from behind a veil, not seeing Allah, but there was no intermediary between them. And Musa was given uh, the tablets and he spoke with Allah uh, for 30 days. He was uh, speaking with Allah on Mount Sinai and then uh, Allah blessed him with 10 days more. And the people, the Israelites, after the 30 days were over and Musa didn't come back, they decided to start worshipping the golden calf. And this is something that is mentioned in their books. It's not just in our uh, books as well. And subhanAllah, it shows us that even the righteous and the prophets, they have to sometimes deal with problems from within and not just problems from without. And Allah tells Musa that go back to your people, they've taken a golden calf as a false god. So Musa, فَرَجَعَ إِلَىٰ قَوْمِ غَضْبَانَ asifa. He came very angry back to his people. Then when he saw the calf, فَأَلْقَ الْأَلْوَاحَ He threw the tablets and the tablets broke. Subhanallah. When Allah told him, he was angry. 
when he saw with his own eyes, that's when his anger exploded. And that's how human beings are. The one who sees is not like the one who hears. To see the reality is not like the same as reading or uh, hearing about it. So when he saw his people worshipping the calf, he gets rid of the tablets that Allah gifted him. It's the most precious thing on earth. But in his anger, this is what happens when you get angry, that you sometimes act in a manner that you yourself will regret. No matter how righteous you are, your emotions need to be controlled. So Musa alayhi salam, his anger, and he was a person of, as we know, so he threw the, the, uh, the tablets, they cracked. And then instead of getting angry at his people, the first person he goes to is his own brother Harun. And he holds on to his beard and his, and his hair. And Harun, in front of everybody, he begins rebuking him. How dare you let them do this? And Harun says, قَالَ ابْنَ أُمَّ My dear son of my mother, my dear son of my mother, listen to me first before you jump, before you do this. إِنَّ الْقَوْمَ صَدْعَفُونِي وَكَادُوا يَقْتُلُونَنِي My own people, they were about to kill me. They forced me to do this. They didn't listen to me. And subhanAllah, this shows us another beautiful thing. Harun and Musa were blood brothers. They were the same mother and father. Harun and Musa were both prophets of Allah, appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet, what Musa could do, Harun could not do. And what Harun could do, Musa could not do. They're both righteous people, but the effect of Musa on his people was not the same as the effect of Harun. And this shows us a very important fact of life, dear Muslims. Not everybody is cut out for the exact same tasks. Not every scholar or leader or da'i can do the exact same thing with the exact same method and the exact same techniques. We all have our characters. We all have our personalities and based on our personalities, there is a niche that we can shine in, we can be strong in. Harun did not have that level of, uh, if you like, sternness that Musa did, that, that Musa could have the impact that Harun could have. And Harun, by the way, uh, was considered, you know, his descendants are considered to be the more scholarly. And the, so that, that each one of them is given something that the other has not been given. We all have a role to play. Just because one person or one da'i or one sheikh or one leader or one individual cannot do the same as other people, we don't compare, you know, like, oh, you're not doing this. You, know. you look at the person and what he has been given. You look at the talents and strengths that that person has, and then you see what is the maximum potential within your realm. Harun was not blameworthy for what happened under his watch. And Musa uh, was able to then obviously uh, bring the, the Bani Israel in check, and Musa then calms down. Once Musa calmed down, and he took the broken alwah, and he asked Allah's uh, forgiveness, and he asked forgiveness for the children of Israel. And a beautiful passage from verse 156, uh, that, إليك, That, O oh Allah, Inscribe for us, write for us all good in this world and write for us good in the hereafter. We have turned to you. Some of our scholars said, Hudna is what the Yahud actually meant that they were turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah said, My punishment, قَالَ إِنَّ عَذَابِي, my punishment, it will only inflict those whom I choose. As for my mercy, it encompasses everything. SubhanAllah, what a beautiful verse here. My punishment will only, this is verse 156, my punishment will only go to the select people that I choose. But my mercy encompasses everything. So I shall especially write it. I'm going to give an extra dosage of mercy to those who act righteously and those who give charity and those who believe in our signs. Those who follow the Prophet, verse 157, the unlettered ummi, the unlettered Prophet, whom they find mentioned in the Torah and the Injil. Allah is saying, this man Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has been predicted in the previous books as well. And now what follows is one of the most beautiful descriptions, especially in Arabic, especially in Arabic. And again, what justice can an English translation do to the original Arabic, the divine speech of Allah? Read the Quran in Arabic. And I have to say here, dear brothers and sisters, I know it's a different language for most of us, but still just strive to learn even words here and there. And bit by bit, just make it a point to try understanding the Quran and the original Arabic. There are plenty of classes online so that you can inshallah enjoy and understand even a little bit, even if it's 40-50% when you hear the Quran being uh, recited. So in the Arabic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
ذات الذين يتبعون الرسول النبي الامي الذي يجدونه مكتوبا عنده في التوراه والانجيل يامرهم بالمعروف وينهاهم عن المنكر ويحل لهم الطيبات ويحرم عليهم الخبائث ويضع عنهم اسرهم والاغلال التي كانت عليهم that they, they follow the prophet whom they find mentioned in their own books he commands them to do good deeds he forbids them from doing evil things deeds he allows for them all that is pure he forbids for them that which is filthy. He unloads from them the burdens and the shackles and the chains that were upon them. He frees them from the bondages they were in. And the bondages here mean the bondages of ignorance, the bondages of slavery over your own desires, the bondages of wandering like lost animals. Our religion of Islam, the religion of Allah, it frees mankind that you have a noble goal. You're no longer shackled to your desires. You're no longer living just for the moment, the carpe diem, as, as they say in these uh, the modern times, just live for the moment, YOLO, you only live once. No, we are living for the Akhirah. We are living for a higher goal. And our Prophet ﷺ is coming to lift from us those shackles and to make us understand that we are here for that noble purpose of living the life of the human being that Allah Azza wa Jal has honored. So unloads from them the burdens and the shackles that are upon them. Therefore, whoever believes in the Prophet, whoever respects the Prophet, whoever supports the Prophet, whoever follows the light that the Prophet ﷺ came with, four things are mentioned. The these are the people who shall be successful. Beautiful passage over here. Once again, uh, make sure that you uh, read it. In the next section, we move on to the story of the fishermen. And the fisherman story, it tells us of a group of people of the Israelites who were blatantly uh, transgressing against a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the righteous people were themselves divided into two camps. The people who did not participate in this trickery or deceit. So in their sharia, and it was a very strict sharia, they could not do any work on the Sabbath, on, Friday, on the Saturday. So uh, they were not allowed to fish on the, uh, for example, not uh, go to work. So what they did was that right before the Maghrib time on Friday, they would set up all the fish nets and lower them in the ground and then go and sleep and then come back, you know, after sunset on the Saturday, so the Saturday is over, but the work was done while they were sleeping and the nets were set up to do the work on Saturday. And so this is a clear violation that you're trying to trick the law. And this is something that, you know, Allah knows, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ If you're trying to trick the sharia, it doesn't work that way. So the righteous people who were not participating in that action, they got divided. And one group amongst them kept on advising them, saying, don't do this, stop this. And the other group said, why are you giving them advice? They're going to be destroyed, let them be. And subhanAllah, in the Quran we learn that explicitly the first group was saved. The second group that was not committing the sin, but considered the sinners to be gone and lost. Allah is silent what their fate was. And to this day, the scholars of tafsir are debating were they saved or not. And what this shows us, the story of the fishermen, what it shows us, two things primarily. Number one, an evil trick. To, to outwit the sharia doesn't work. Now what is an evil trick? The scholars of fiqh know, and that's something you will study fiqh. And not everything that is an easy fatwa is an evil trick. No, this is a common misconception that many average Muslims have. If two fatwas are there and the easier one is there, they'll automatically think the easier one is a trick. No, it's more complicated than this, and this goes back to the books of fiqh. But the point being, the scholars know sometimes it's called a hiyala or a trick. We don't do tricks in the sharia. You don't trick Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are no such thing as evil tricks. The next thing that we learn from this, very important, that we should never ever feel a sense of arrogance against sinful people. Nor should we stop preaching the truth to sinful people thinking that we are better than them. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is silent about the fate of that group that were not transgressing against the Sabbath, yet felt the people who were transgressing were lost beyond hope. And they felt a sense of superiority. And the first group they didn't feel that way. Allah says that they said, we're advising them so that maybe perchance they can come back to Allah and also so that we have an excuse in front of Allah that we are doing our job, that we're showing them the, 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 the right path. And this shows us that we should never ever stop being positive role models. We should never feel superior even to those who are, yes, somebody is a sinner and you see the sin. That doesn't mean that you are better than them if you don't commit that sin. That's the key point. You might have the sin of arrogance, which is what Iblis had, the sin of arrogance. You have to be careful. We separate 
it in this instance the hatred of the sin from the sinner in this instance there's no question we do that that we don't feel superior to the sinful even as we thank Allah for not committing that sin difference between the two and we see this in this story over here very uh, clearly uh, two other uh, minor incidents before we get to the uh, minor, minor um, um, stories if you like or anecdotes before we get to the conclusion of the surah verse 169 Verse 169, Allah talks about a group of people who came after Musa, after the children of Israel, um, their forefathers, when they saw all of this, the next generations, Allah said, There came after them, after an, uh, a number of generations, groups of people who didn't take the covenant seriously. They became lazy and they committed the sins and they said, lana. Allah, will, Allah is going to forgive us. Allah is going to forgive us, no big deal. And Allah warns us against that attitude. We have to be very careful. Wallahi, when you read this verse, you cannot help but think of the Sahaba and think of us. Wallahi, I'm just being honest here, I'm just being blunt here. You cannot help think of the Sahaba and what they did, and then think of us. Then after them came people, they committed every sin. And they said, no big deal, Allah is going to forgive us. You know, Allah does forgive but He forgives those who are genuinely, sincerely repentant. Allah does not forgive the lazy. Allah does not forgive the one whose arrogance is Allah is going to forgive. No, you have to lower your head and genuinely hope for Allah's forgiveness and fear that perhaps Allah is not going to forgive you. The one who has that arrogant attitude, Allah is going to forgive me. How do you know? Do you have a contract? Do you have a, a signed document? How are you guaranteed this? And Allah criticizes in verse 169, Allah criticizes the attitude of you doing every sin in the book and saying, ah, don't worry, Allah is ghafoor, Allah is rahim. Allah is indeed ghafoor and rahim, but to those who genuinely deserve maghfirah and uh, rahma. And in verse 175, 176, we find another very dangerous uh, metaphor and example that we need to be careful of and that is the one whom Allah blessed with knowledge and the one whom Allah raised the ranks of with knowledge and yet that knowledge did not benefit him and that knowledge uh, became a matter of arrogance for him and he became misguided because he did not uh, act in accordance with that knowledge. So this warns us against another mindset and that is the extreme of Arrogant, of uh, knowledge leading us to arrogance and knowledge leading us to having no spirituality. These are two unfortunately common motifs in every civilization. It was in the Jewish, it's in the Christian, it's in the Muslim one as well. Unfortunately, that's the reality. So we have to be careful of both of these paradigms. The first, lazy people who just don't work uh, according to the laws of Islam and then they say, Allah is going to forgive me. And the second is those scholars, we seek Allah's refuge from ever being amongst them, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah. Those scholars who uh, their knowledge does not impact them and they uh, become arrogant and they don't live up in accordance with their knowledge and the, the story are, is mentioned in the books of Tafsir in more um, detail. Uh, before I get to the final conclusion, there's one verse that I really wanted to comment on, verse 43. And I always have one or two verses I just bring some attention to, verse 43, that Allah says in the Quran, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِم مِّنْ غِلْ When the people will enter Jannah, we shall remove the anger and hatred that is in their hearts. And they will be with rivers under which uh, the, the, the trees under which rivers flow. And they will say in Jannah, Alhamdulillahilladhi hadana lihada. We thank Allah who has guided us to this place in Jannah. And were it not for Allah, we would never have been guided. SubhanAllah, what a beautiful, beautiful verse here. It shows us many things. Of them, it is possible that two people don't get along in this world, and the both of them will be in Jannah. وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِ مِنْ غِلْ it is possible that two people will have an issue between them, but they will be fine in Jannah. And it is said that Muawi and Ali radiallahu anhum, they both quoted this verse about each other as well, subhanAllah, amongst the Sahaba. Also, it is, uh, this verse shows us that when you have ill will in your heart, when you have matters of hatred and jealousy, that in fact you are depriving yourself of the peace of Jannah. Because the people of Jannah, they will have that removed from their heart. You cannot be at peace when you have ill will and jealousy and hatred of other people. Whoever attains a pure heart in this world has attained a peace of Jannah in this world. And now we get to the conclusion, very powerful conclusion, verse 196, that Inna waliyi Allah, my wali, my protector is Allah who has sent the book down and he shall take care of the righteous people. Verse 199, 
all of Islam is summarized and all of what we're supposed to do is summarized here. خُذِ الْعَفْوَ وَأْمُرْ بِالْعُرْفِ وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ Be tolerant and merciful. Command that which is good and turn away from the ignorant. What a beautiful three sentences. What a powerful message that only Allah can say. Verse 201, Allah reminds us that shaitan is going to come and whisper to us. And the righteous are those who, when a whispering of shaitan comes to them, they are reminded and they see clearly that this is from shaitan. They see that this is from shaitan. Say so they do not act upon it. Dear Muslims, to have a bad thought is not bad. To fight the bad thought is good. And to overcome the bad thought is the essence of piety. To have a bad thought, that is from shaitan. Don't feel bad for having bad thoughts. The bad thought is from shaitan. And that's what Allah is saying. The righteous people, when they see the impulse come, they recognize this is from shaitan. Blame shaitan and kick it out of your mind. Turn to refuge in Allah and seek isti'adah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse 204, when the Quran is recited, Listen to it and pay attention to it so that you may experience mercy. And then the verse concludes, the final message of this surah. Throughout all of this struggle between good and evil, throughout all of this struggle between you and shaitan, between the people of truth and the people of falsehood, what will be your weapon? What will you do to maintain your sanity? How will you maintain all of this that you're supposed to be doing? Verse 205, and remember your Lord within yourself. وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ فِي نَفْسِكَ Do dhikr of Allah all the time. The dhikr of Allah, the dua of Allah, that is our weapon. Do dhikr of Allah within yourself, silently, humbly, and fearfully, quietly. Don't do it out loud in front of everybody. Do it between yourself in the morning and in the evening. And don't be of those who neglect Allah. Subhanallah. You want to win all of this? All you have to do is to constantly remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah finishes the surah by reminding us that even the mighty angels were in the presence of Allah. They are humble enough to bow down to Allah. They recite His praises and they do sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here now is the first time in the whole Quran we get to the sajda at tilawa. There are around 14 times in the Quran where our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the verse was recited in Arabic, that he would then prostrate. Of course, now because we did not recite it uh, it's not something that needs to be done but when you recite the Quran in Arabic and you come to the Sajdat Tilawa it is strongly encouraged it is Sunnah to do Sajdat Tilawa to demonstrate that we too also will be respectful uh, like the angels are and so we conclude by saying exactly what Surah Al-A'raf says, Alhamdulillahi alladhi hadana lihada. We thank Allah for having guided us to this. وَمَا كُنَّا لِنَهْتَدِيَ لَوْلَا أَنْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ And we would never have been guided unless Allah had chosen us for this guidance. Inshallah with this, I conclude this uh, lesson. And tomorrow, by the way, inshallah, for Surah Al-Anfal, please bring your Quran or have a Quran open because we're going to do something different. We're going to go over the whole Surah, inshallah, almost verse by verse. So please bring the Quran for tomorrow. Jazakumullah khairan. Salam. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يا من أجبت دعاء نوح فانتصر وحملته في فلكك المشحون يا من أحال النار حول خليله روحا وريحانا بقولك كون